Coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. The kids, you know, they just love it out here. Just absolutely beautiful, gorgeous area here on the edge of East Texas. We have significant amount of water to allow the cranes to roost and the local farming areas around provide feeding areas for them during the day. People ought to watch and admire the animals that they see. And then they can learn more about them. I think that's a blue jay. Texas Parks and Wildlife, a television series for all outdoors. This series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchase of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $40 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks, Guts, Glory, Ram. They're so graceful. I paint with soft pastels. This looks like a good place. Wildlife artist Bruce DeFore hopes to capture sandhill cranes on their yearly migration to Texas. Okay, I see this plateau, which is much closer than the distant ones. Bruce prefers to sketch in a natural setting. In a photograph, doesn't matter how good it is, you can't get the true color. So you have to come outdoors and see nature for yourself. I've never seen this many of them together in one place. The sandhill crane is thought to be the oldest surviving bird species in the world. They stand three to four feet in height, have a wingspan of up to six feet, and travel farther than any other crane species. After nesting in the Arctic regions of Siberia, Alaska, and Canada, these migrants head south for the winter. Half a million cranes migrate in October and November, and many spend their time in the Texas Panhandle and High Plains. Mule Shoe National Wildlife Refuge, northwest of Lubbock, is a popular stopping point. Oh, we got some birds out there this morning. Oh yeah, they're roosting over here in this northwest corner. Refuge manager Harold Byerman is up early for his daily bird count. We do that to uh, determine trends and also uh, to provide numbers of cranes to area farmers, uh, wildlife observers, birders, and hunters. I estimate we've probably got a good 18 to 20,000. Mule Shoe encompasses nearly 6,000 acres and attracts more cranes than any other refuge in Texas. Oh, they're beautiful. Look at the way they're preening themselves. Oh, getting all pretty for the day. Mule Shoe provides a perfect opportunity for sandhill cranes here in the Texas Panhandle. We have significant amount of water to allow the cranes to roost, and the local farming areas around provide feeding areas for them during the day. That's probably why this, this refuge holds as many cranes as we do, is it just provides all aspects of their, their needs in the wintertime. In the evening, these spring-fed shallow lakes are crucial for the cranes. The sandhill cranes prefer the shallow lakes because they only like a few inches of water to roost at night. They like to have water on their ankles, so to speak. We've noticed that if the lakes are too deep and that the cranes just avoid using them.
I love the coloration, that red on the top of their head. You see, I'm using a colored paper instead of using white, which is nice because you have sort of a middle value. So when I put the sky in, it really begins to show up quickly. Man, listen to all the cranes. They're in wheat stubble. I don't see this many wheat stubble very often. Here in the Panhandle, biologist Bill Johnson monitors the status of sandhill cranes for the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department. The cranes that we have in this area, for the most part, are lesser sandhill cranes, uh, which are one of the smaller subspecies. They're long-lived birds. They'll live close to 20 years. Sandhill cranes will mate for life. Now, they have to be about eight years old before they successfully reproduce. These cranes can see better than just about any other bird, I think. I won't be surprised if they don't spook here real soon. Bill Johnson worries about these cranes. The birds rely on 20 or so spring-fed lakes in the area for fresh water, and many of these key roosting sites are shrinking. These springs get their water from the Ogallala Aquifer and other sources of underground storage water. But pumping for agricultural purposes has caused the water table in the aquifer to decline. And if it drops below the level that feeds the springs, which it has in many cases, many of the saline lakes are totally dry now. Uh, when that happens, saline lakes will no longer be dependable sources of roosting water or drinking water for sandhill cranes. This is probably the first stage of the painting, which is to lay out the drawing, begin to lay in some color. You have to work quickly when you're painting outdoors because everything changes. It's changed uh, just since I've been painting this. The cranes are roosting right at the edge right here. If you look, you really wouldn't be able to tell. You certainly can't see individual cranes. You just see this mass, which is sort of shaped like a triangle, jutting out into the lake. As part of the winter migration, a Gulf Coast group of sand hills skip the panhandle and head for the coasts of Mexico and Texas. And a large percentage of those that stop on the Texas coast winter here on these coastal prairies and, and ag fields and, and coastal marshes surrounding this area. This area is the Clive Runnels family Mad Island Marsh Preserve. Operated by the Nature Conservancy, this refuge is a one-stop roosting spot with coastal prairie, rice fields, marshes, and ponds. So when they arrive here on the wintering grounds, they tend to stay in their family groups where you'll have two adults and one, one juvenile. And that juvenile spends the, the winter with them feeding and, and it kind of follows their lead on what to eat, where to go. The cranes feed in the farm fields, prairies, and these plentiful marshes. The sandhills in the wetlands tend to feed on a, a variety of, of organisms and, and plant material. A large proportion of their diet down here is tubers and roots. It's basically the basal part of, of plants that grow in the water, like a lot of sedges and rushes. They're not super selective. They utilize whatever food source is available. The coastal prairie marsh doesn't just provide habitat for cranes, but for a myriad of bird species. You, you really don't know what you're going to see. You know, there's the sand hills and, and waterfowl and shorebirds and wading birds. And there's hawks flying over. It's just really a unique place, and it's, it's neat that we can provide a place for these birds to thrive. We're lucky to get the action we've seen today. To see them flying overhead, it's a rare sight. I'm blessed to be a part of it. For Bruce DeFore, this intimate glimpse at the Sandhill Crane migration has come to a close. His art will serve as a reminder of this adventure until they meet again next winter. What's really cool to me is that when it's complete, I recall everything uh, that I went through during that time. The environment, 
the temperature, the people I was with, maybe. And so it's a special thing to me. Uh, it has a life of its own. Three or four thousand birds. When it comes to birds, bird watching, and bird hunting, there's no place like Texas. One special opportunity in Texas is sandhill crane hunting. In fact, Texans harvest more sandhill cranes than any other state in the nation. However, we are also home to more total bird species than any other state, including some non-game birds, such as herons and the endangered hooping crane that may look like sandhill cranes. That means Texas hunters must be sure before they shoot. Yeah, looks like we've got a pretty good group coming in. There are several ways that hunters, yeah, we'll as well as bird we'll watchers, can be more confident of their identification in the field. Remember to think flaps. First, ask yourself, what is the flock size like? Sandhill cranes often fly in large flocks, but hooping cranes are usually found in pairs or in small groups, and herons are often solitary. Second, how good is your light? Hooping cranes can look gray in poor light, while sandhill cranes can look very pale in some light conditions. Third, what is the action or motion of their wings? Both cranes fly with a strong, steady beat, but heron species have slower, more erratic wing beats. Next, what is the pattern of flight? Cranes often fly in a V or a line overhead. Herons often fly just above the water. What is the sound of their calls? The hooping crane has a strong bugling call, and sandhill cranes have a rattling purr. But many non-game species are mostly silent in flight. Finally, what is the shape or silhouette? You can think of cranes being shaped like a sleek arrow, while herons are more gangly. Texas hunters have great opportunities and great responsibilities. By asking yourself these six questions, you can become a better hunter or bird watcher. And you can also ensure that you play a role in the ongoing conservation of all our bird species. We're located between Houston and Dallas on I-45, halfway between both, somewhat central Texas. Some people say, well, you're in East Texas. I say, no, East Texas starts about 100 yards right over here. <laughs> Fort Boggy State Park. We get our name from a blockhouse ranger station that was in the area in the early 1800s. It was home for the Trinity Rangers. They helped keep peace in the area here on El Camino Real Trail. Midsummer and early spring, if you come out for the wildflowers that we have along the roadsides, uh, you may want to bring some bug spray because it, it turns into Fort Buggy for a while. We have a huge amount of birds here. We have bluebirds, woodpeckers of all shapes and sizes. I like watching nature and I like watching people, so I couldn't ask for a better place to be. Our park is a free day use park right now, Wednesday through Sunday. Unfortunately, we do not have any camping yet. We have an, an open pavilion that we use uh, for family reunions and birthday parties and stuff. We have a church group from B. Dice Baptist Church. Paid for our pavilion to get under, be shady and cool, and fish and swim. The kids, you know, they just love it out here. It's, it's a fun place and it's a family place. We have about three and a half mile of trail here at Fort Boggy. They're very easy to walk. Also, you can bring your, your mountain bikes and bike up and down the trails. We have just a few steep hills to try to climb but it's a very easy trail to get up and down. Our local Chamber of Commerce was gracious enough to buy us some paddle boats that we could put out here at the park. We supply you a life jacket and uh, no rental cost to them. We have a small but productive lake. It's fun to come fish. I think I got a three ounce fish one time. <laughs> a whale. <laughs> we just come here for the tranquility and the peace that's around here. The whole deal of the fish. Like everything else, it's just patience. Whether you're walking one of the trails or fishing in the lake or, or just, you know, sitting at a picnic table, this is the place. There's woods, there's open space. 
every bit of it is just real picturesque and, and something that you, you won't forget. It's a new adventure here every season. And just absolutely beautiful, gorgeous area here on the edge of East Texas. Environment is a major influence in the development of any child. And for children growing up in the inner city, that environment can be a hostile. This is Houston's third war, a neighborhood struggling to recapture better days. The community's landscape is marked with both poverty. Inside of every seed is a living plant and hope. We're making a place where students and nature can come together and enjoy each other. If we planted this tree wrong, it would never grow the way it should. Glenn Miller and Leatrice Greenwood operate the Outdoor Heritage Learning Center. It's headquartered at Blackshire Elementary and is funded entirely by donations and grants. One, two, three. Great. Why operate in Third Ward? Third Ward is probably one of the farthest places away from nature. And I said, that's exactly where we need to take nature, to take it back to the inner city. We should teach them about what is most accessible to them, where they are. There's nature all around you. You don't have to necessarily go to the forest or go to the woods. You can find signs of nature all around you. Just hold it with your hand. There you go. It won't hurt. Don't be afraid of them. That's the main thing. And what do you think these are? Antennas. Antennas, correct, oh, correct. Sure. Do you have any of those near your house? <laughs> it's How does that a lot feel? of them in the ditch. A lot of them in the ditch? Watch, when he gets to the deeper grass, he'll probably stop for a while. To have the opportunity to become rich in the interaction with other living creatures, to learn from them the necessary will to survive under difficult situations such as those that poverty creates. I do look to outdoor heritage and nature education as being a part of the answer for some of the urban blight. This is Kumi Homes, a 550-unit housing project a few blocks from Blackshire Elementary. OK, ladies, come on. Let's get in there and get this tent up. Today, some of the mothers are learning how to set up a tent. Lift this part up. Oh, OK. Now, oh, OK. They're getting ready to take their kids on their first camping trip. Nature is something that has no guidelines on economic standards. Not the blue. There are no exclusions. Everyone can take and partake of nature. Do we have another one? One more I want to learn so much until I can just be able to achieve the, the outdoor going of my own, not just with everyone else. With all the things that are going on with children today, whether with drugs and things of that nature, it gives them a different outlook, another direction to go in. Okay, how about this? We'd like to take. <laughs> Today, the kids are on a field trip to a nearby state park. Catch with both hands. They're gonna be real slippery. Most of these children will touch the scales of a fish for the very first time. <laughs> These are the ones we use. 
The kids have not been exposed to anything but the ghettos. <laughs> it's straight up, you know, ghetto life, fighting, scrabbling, you know, arguing all the time. Them things gonna stick? No, they aren't. No, they aren't. There you go. All right. There you go. Now just go take him over to the water. Whoa, there you go. See? I'm gonna catch another one. Okay, let's do it. Who got another one? Look at the size of this homunculus thing. Oh. Nature. Nature. Take a look at all of that forest. There's 700 acres out there. 700 acres. That's a lot of land. You're the ones who will inherit this. You're the ones who must care for it, learn about it. You become stewards of all this. Here in Texas, the vast majority of our children live in the cities. What's troubling is that most of these kids grow up with little or no contact with the natural world. He's looking at us. Look at a big one, Mama. A big one. A big one. I see, I see his head. I see his head. His head. His head. Just a big one. He's looking at us. It's an alligator right there. I go down there. Well, I go down there. No, you can't go down there, but he's right there on the bank. It's easy to get kids excited when they're on a field trip. The challenge is to encourage them to find nature in their own community like 12-year-old Terrence Edwards, who has discovered bird watching. Abdut. Abundant. Abundant in New England. Feeds are grown on no. R. No, let's start again. Start from that sentence again. Feeds on ground. Mm -hmm. With the help of Ms. Greenwood, he's improving his reading skills. Oh! Okay. That tells you the sound that you use. And that's how I know. So that you can identify them by their what? Whistles. Correct. What's most impressive about Terrence is that he's taken bird watching out of the classroom and into his third ward neighborhood. Some people just hate wild animals. All they all do is just, they all just watch me, see how they play. Each day after school, Terrence quietly watches the world around him. You see that bird right over there? That red bird? That's a red cardinal. Right here on the fence. This is Terrence's sanctuary, a vacant, abandoned lot across the street from his house. People ought to watch and admire the animals that they see. And then they can learn more about them. Even here in the city, you can see raccoons that could be out there in your trash. Terrence has learned the lessons can be very simple, to see things other people don't, and to understand nature is close by, no matter where we are. I think that's a, when we, I think that's a blue jay. For every child like Terrence, for every neighborhood, like the Third Ward, there is a richness, a natural heritage waiting to be discovered. The problem is there aren't enough people to reach out and develop that potential. Cause my park is your park and your park is my park. You feel worse by doing nothing. And um, that's really feeling bad, is <laughs> when you know there is something you can contribute and you don't. Because your park is my park, and my park is your park.
This series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchase of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $40 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks. Guts. Glory. Ram.